guys. Welcome back to the Exodus Project. I'm your host, Steve Eisenhower. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about the Passover lamb, um, how the New Testament equates that as a shadow or type for Jesus' sacrifice, and how when we truly see that in context, it has nothing to do with a human sacrifice. The two are mutually exclusive. And if they do have to do with one another, then if anything, it proves that Jesus is not the Messiah and his sacrifice is um, irrelevant. But before I get started, hit that subscribe button, turn on the notifications, and give me a big thumbs up. Okay, so for starters, I'd like to begin with a few passages of Scripture. So, first... I'm going to quote Paul in 1 Corinthians 5, 7. He writes, Purge out therefore the old leaven. We know that matzah, unleavened bread, uh, it's the festival of unleavened bread, right? Um, so he says, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Okay. So, here, Paul is really asserting that the leaven is sin, right? And his audience is the dough. So, when we purge out the leaven, a.k.a. the sin, we um, are creating a better, a better dough, right? A, a, a sinless community. It's perfecting the community when the sin is purged out. That's pretty clear from the writing. Um, and then he expounds, this is all possible because Christ, the Passover lamb, was sacrificed for us. That we could have our sin purged out, our sin taken away. Right? And that's, you know, loosely following the order of Passover, how on the eve of Passover, the preparation day, you know, you would kill the lamb, take it home and eat it, and then, you know, you eat it with the matzah and the bitter herbs, etc. Okay, but what does the, what does the Torah have to say on the matter? You know, is this a legitimate metaphor, or isn't it? Right? So, in Exodus 8.26, we see, and Moses said, it is not meat to do so, for we shall sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians to the Lord our God. Lo, shall we sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians before their eyes, and they will not stone us. So, that, that passage of Moses speaking, it calls the lamb the abomination of the Egyptians. So, what could that mean? If, if the lamb is there to atone for Israel's sin, then why would Moses call it an abomination? And why would the Egyptians stone them if they were to sacrifice it. And we can even take a step back in Genesis when Joseph's brothers arrive in Egypt and they have to go before the Pharaoh and tell them what their occupation is. Uh, Joseph outright tells them, say that you're herders of cattle and not shepherds. Why is that? Why, why would being a shepherd or why would sacrificing a lamb, a sheep, or a goat, be so abominable? Why would it be so, uh, you know, <laughs> not good in the eyes of the Egyptians? Why would that be a bad thing to do? So, to quote the Encyclopedia, Encyclopedia Britannica, we see that the Egyptian god Kanum, that's K-H-N-U-M, was represented as a man. I'm sure you've. I'm sure everyone here has at least um, seen has at least seen Egyptian hieroglyphics or whatever. You know, you would see the people, and they have an animal head, right? It was the body of a person and then an animal's head. Those are the depictions of the deities in Egypt, right? So, Encyclopedia Britannica reads, Kanum, also spelled Kanemu. Uh, is the ancient Egyptian god of fertility, associated with water and with procreation. 
Kanum was worshipped from the first dynasty, which is between 2925 and 2775 BCE, into the early centuries CE. So his worship was for close to 500, or close to, um, I guess that'd be about 4,000 years. He was, he was a very high up main deity in Egypt, so much so that his, at the Kanum cult, I guess you could say, was worshiping him for around 4,000 years. 1,500 years prior to the Exodus. So, he was represented as a ram with horizontal twisting horns, or as a man with a ram's head. As I said, that's citing the Encyclopedia Britannica. So further, let's try to equate this to modern terms. If we were in India right now, and you went to a McDonald's, you wouldn't be able to get a hamburger, right? They don't eat beef because cows are a sacred animal. This is basically an exact parallel to what we're seeing here in Exodus. So if you were to go to, let's say, 1500 BCE Egypt, right, you know, right before the Exodus, not long before the Exodus, you would see lambs walking around free Rome. They would not need shepherds. Why? Because the lamb, the sheep, would be the physical representation on earth of Canum, right? So does your God need a shepherd? Of course not. That's how the Egyptians are looking at this. I, I am not above my God, so I can't, I can't possibly shepherd it, right? And even less, kill it. And this is why Moses refers to it as an abomination, because it's an Egyptian idol. It's the physical representation of one of their gods. It's something they worship. So, when they bring one into their homes four days prior, and then, you know, they slaughter it and eat it and put its, put its blood upon the threshold or, or the doorposts and, you know. Um, what this is signifying is they have a greater reverence, they have a greater fear for God who commanded them to do it than they do for their Egyptian oppressors. And to take this one step further, uh, if we look into all the plagues, what exactly were the plagues? They were attacks on Egypt's pantheon, right? So the Nile turns to blood. The Nile was worshipped as a god. Um, frogs, lice. The sun went black, right? Ra was the, the big sun god. He was like their Zeus, right? So darkness, it's an attack on Ra, etc., etc. All these, all these different plagues were an attack on the different gods of the Egyptian pantheon. So, finally, you get to the tenth plague. The lamb is slaughtered, so you're physically killing. You're bringing into your home. You're basically enslaving the god of the Egyptians. You're then killing it. You're putting its blood on the doorpost, which is a physical sign, a representation. Hey, I just took your god of my house, killed it, and now I'm eating it. So, it's, it's a complete... Uh, showing complete disdain for the abomination of the Egyptians, and like I said, reverence for the true creator, and no reverence for the false gods of Egypt, or the Egyptian oppressors as a whole. But further, why the firstborns? And the Torah goes even to say, all the way up to the house of Pharaoh is affected, Right? So what's the, what's the significance? We know that the Torah doesn't waste words. So why include even up to the house of Pharaoh? Okay, so in ancient cultures, and we even see this with the Israelites, that the firstborn was sanctified as a priest, but then we also see later that the Levites become the priesthood, or the, the priestly tribe, and there is a money payment to redeem back your firstborn. We don't have to get into that, but just take my word for it that in ancient cultures, the firstborn was sanctified as the priest. 
So what this is showing is, first of all, Pharaoh. He was manifestation of a god on earth, a god-man, right? So his son is the next in line to be the god-man. And the firstborns of the people, obviously, as I just noted, the priesthood. The firstborn was sanctified as the priesthood. So in one fell swoop, God is attacking the next man-god, the next god that will rule over Egypt, attacking all his priests, and also the sign by which the pious of the Israelites who are who do it, who you know, do the the slaughter of the lamb, the canoe. It's this it's it's the entire sign is another Egyptian god. So we can see that this is really God showing that he is sovereign, he is the singular power. Uh, and one more point I'd like to touch on. Um, we see that the, the plague that really rattled Pharaoh, the one that really showed him that the God of Israel is the true God, right? That was the plague of fire and hail mixed together. Why would a plague like that really rattle Pharaoh? Why would that convince him? So, as I just mentioned, all these plagues were attacks on Egyptian gods, right? So what, what does that show? So clearly there was a god of fire, you know, god of ice. The two are mutually exclusive in a polytheist's thinking. If you have a god that's in charge of one and a god, god that's in charge of the other, they can't come together as one. So what this is showing, God is showing that everything comes from me. I am the singular power, I am the only creator, Therefore, only I can fuse ice and fire. And that's what, you know, really rattled Pharaoh. But regardless, moving forward, um, the Passover lamb is a visible sign of reverence before God. It shows a fear of God that is greater than the fear of the Egyptian oppressors, as I already mentioned. So, if Jesus... And we see this in the book of John also. Uh, John the Baptist says, Behold, the Lamb of God is coming who takes away the sins of the world. Um, I want to say this is John 19. Reads, um, To fulfill the, fulfill the scriptures, not a bone of him was broken. That's a, that's a reference back to the Passover Lamb, obviously. So it's, it's clearly, it's, it's all over the New Testament. Pauline and Johannian theology, for sure, aim to propose that Jesus was the Passover lamb. The congregation is the unleavened bread. And the leaven is sin, right? But for this to be legitimate, that would mean that the Passover sacrifice, the Passover lamb, would have to be a sin sacrifice. But as we demonstrated, as we just saw from Exodus... It clearly isn't. If anything, you would call it a righteousness offering. It's, it's a showing of reverence before God. It has nothing to do with sin. It's an abomination. Moses calls it an abomination of the Egyptians. Therefore, if you want to equate the two, you would have to reconcile that Jesus is an abom a, a pagan abomination and... His sacrifice is, if anything, a, uh, a visible sign of reverence before the true God, right? You're, you're taking out the false God. So it just all falls apart. Um, the Passover sacrifice has nothing to do with sin. That's clear. So to make that equation, it's, it's just, it's all off. It's presenting a postulate that doesn't exist. And for anyone who might, you know, reference Leviticus, where it's talking about the sin sacrifice being a lamb, etc., well, go back and read it again, because when you're when you do dig into this, the the Paschal lamb has to be a yearling male, right? 
A sin sacrifice lamb, as recounted in Leviticus, has to be a female. So unless Jesus was a female, it doesn't work. Secondly, one of Jesus' most famous parables is that of the sheep and the goats. Right? The goats are the, the sinners, and the sheep are the, the good flock. You know, they're the, they're the righteous, the sheep are righteous, and the goats, the goats are the wicked, right? Well, how does that work? When we go back to Exodus, we actually see that the Passover lamb could be from the sheep or the goats. So that means Jesus could have equally as much been a goat as a sheep. So are there, there are just so many angles upon which this doesn't work. Um, we're not even going to touch on human sacrifice. That's a different show that I've, I've talked about before with rabbis, etc. But the takeaway from this is the Christian Bible is proposing that Jesus is the Passover lamb. Okay, if that's what you want to propose, that's what you want to propose. But we need to weigh that next to what Exodus says the Passover lamb is. And we see that it's a slaughtering of an Egyptian idol. And it's, it's really it's re flicking your nose at the Egyptians. is really what it was. It was an, it, all the plagues were attacks on Egyptian gods. So, therefore, once you have some context and historical context that the Lamb was the physical representation of one of ancient Egypt's most important deities, therefore, now you understand, well, okay, that would mean that Jesus' sacrifice, if we are to believe John and Paul, is, you know, the death of the personification of an Egyptian idol. So yeah, that's really all I have to say on the topic. Um, but until next time, guys, thanks for watching. Um, I always appreciate it. I'm doing a book giveaway when I hit 1,000 subscribers. We're almost there, about 170 away, 160 away. Um, so keep hitting, you know, hit that subscribe button. It's gonna, I'm going to give away uh, two copies of Rabbi Stuart Federo's Judaism and Christianity, a Contrast. So be on the lookout for that. Uh, and also, I have an ebook coming out. Um, it'll be free. So I, I will keep everyone updated on that as well. But until next time, guys, this was the Exodus Project. I'm your host, Steve Eisenhower, and I'll see you next time.